how this shit... likely has completely crashed my testosterone levels, turning me into more or less a woman. What if... The answer to all of my problems is the Sazul. According to YouTube guidelines shown here, videos which intend to educate are documentary by nature and do not glorify the use of drugs, both abide by community safety guidelines and are eligible for monetization. The following video does not glorify the use of drugs, instead attempts to be unbiased while delivering unlike safety information disguised as entertainment. We do not display graphic use. There are no scenes showcasing drug consumption and any insinuation of use should be taken as satirical at best. Nothing against people who actually want to transition into being female, I simply did not want to do so. In fact, the very thing that makes us men, men, uh, testosterone, is what I believe this compound has unfortunately deprived me of. Testosterone is responsible for, you know, yeah, facial like hair, deepening of the voice, it's released by your goddamn balls, it is the male sex hormone, and men who lack testosterone, also known as having hypogonadism, well, they also display an array of negative effects. Effects, which I happen to be experiencing thanks to my recent podcast with Derek from moreplatesmoredates.com. He got me thinking, I better go and get some blood work done because I have abused the shit out of opioid-like compounds in the past and maybe even presently, as well as a whole other myriad of substances that probably had a very negative effect on my body's hormone production, and maybe it had something to do with the decline Skipping of my mood to, uh, uh, steadily over the past five years, video. and how, if you are a friend of mine, you would know I basically self-isolate. I don't speak to anybody. I feel overwhelmed all the time. I mean, granted, I've got a lot going on with family and kids and work, but it's like, I just don't want to talk to people. It goes beyond just using the excuse of being busy, I just legitimately do not want to talk to anybody. Like, I basically just want to be left alone all the time, and that's not really how I used to be. Also, the decline in my sexual appetite and a whole other array of, you know, problems that I don't really want to get into here led me to finally getting a comprehensive blood panel done. My testosterone levels to, um... Well, let's just talk about it. We've got, uh, FSH, the shit getting released from the pituitary gland. My result is 2.2. IU slash L, and the reference reference range is anything under 9.5, so that's pretty low. My LH, luteinizing hormone, is 1.9 with the reference, ra reference range of 1.1 to 8.8. Let's make this very clear as well. The um, ranges that uh, Psych Substance is talking about were created by uh, Dr. Travison and various um, other um, doctors that he has worked with. The published studies that have been created, the assays, that LabCorp, Mayo Clinic, um, any European diaspora country utilizes Dr. Travison's reference range which he specifically told me directly in an email. This isn't hearsay. This isn't uh, fourth-hand information. No, Dr. Travis and the guy who created the assay, created the ranges, directly told me that the ranges that we do are a population level. They did these at a population of 1,000 to 3,000 people that are European-aged males that are part of a sick population they have hypogonadism they've got uh um traumatic brain injury they've got opioid abuse they, you know there's all these different things right it is a sample group of a thousand to three thousand people it is a sample of european men only does not include african americans or pakistanis or um you know, people from it, you know, any other country, it only applies to Europeans. And his direct quote is, these ranges cannot be applied individually. <laughs> and signs and symptoms <laughs> are very important. Um, so when we're talking about this, no, there's no Canada's different, or America's different, no. The guidelines state for the UK, for the United States, and for Canada, for the entire European diaspora, that... If I'm not confusing the shit out of everybody watching. We utilize symptomatology that if you present signs and symptoms and you may have correlating which would be zero testosterone ranges. You could even be a thousand, doesn't really matter. Your free testosterone could even be 70 or 100 in GDL. Doesn't matter. If you have signs and symptoms of hypogonadism, 
then that's where we start treatment. And let's also make this very clear as well that the assays are serum testosterone or even free testosterone, which they they make a calculation of sex hormone binding globulin, albumin, and uh, another marker. I'm forgetting the other one. But then they create the free testosterone number calculated based off of those individual numbers. But that is only a snapshot in time that the assay or that the modality or that the testing parameters or the amount of ketchup that you scoop into the cup to evaluate how much ketchup the blood that you have is in that cup is only a snapshot in time of what you're getting and it is not um, accurate and which is why we use guidelines and that the guidelines are symptomatology and if you present signs and symptoms that's when we treat I was just reading about it, but now my brain is starting to get foggy because symptoms of low T are brain fog among one, severe depression among another, erectile dysfunction, which thankfully I never had. Maybe less like rock solid erections. I'm used to being like basically a steel rod kind of and maybe it's gone down to like some balsam wood level, but it's not like unusable by any means. However, in terms of just sheer horniness, you know what's weird is even with these real low levels, I'm still able to get horny. I'm just not like a f sex fiend. So I might... And they are wrong. And also, if a doctor ever says this, they have not done a glucagon simulation test. They don't know what your growth hormone is. They have not done... Um, Talk about my plan to once and... Further testing to find out why. Maybe kind of like an MRI to find out if there's a pituitary tumor and their medical board finds that out and you've reported it because you said well i've got signed in symptoms and this doctor denied me and they didn't do the mri and they didn't do an echocardiogram and they didn't do a glucagon simulation test but now it's on the doctor to then prove why he didn't do that work now a doctor can always say hey you know i'm not educated in this i really am not an expert in this i'll refer you out to someone else hey fine good hey do it fantastic and doctors protect yourself right if you don't want to deal with it protect yourself for, for, for the patient and somebody else. But outright denying someone when we have literally 60,000 deaths just in America, and I'm going to go on a limb here and say it's let's add 20,000 deaths because Canada's population is smaller. So roughly 70 to 80,000 deaths per year between Canada and the United States. Then we have 2.5 million people each year diagnosed with traumatic brain injury, and another 2 million people that have hypogonadism. So let's say that's 5 million people um, in Canada and the United States. Sounds like an epidemic to me. I'm not good at numbers, but someone can figure that out. Per deciliter, and mine was at uh, 251. I'm not, I'm, not quite at, I'm not quite a girl yet. Still pretty good, I think. Might be at the bottom of the barrel for men, but pff, being male's overrated anyway. So that's a, it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that it's making me a woman. Um, but anyway, other interesting blood work to note would be my... Um, Hemoglobin, which is actually flagged. My hemoglobin is 134 G slash L. Not sure what that means. Grams per liter? I don't know. Reference range is 135 to 170. Jesus fucking Christ. Dude, you could literally die from being that low. That's not a, oh, uh, a doctor can just refer you to somewhere else. No, that's a here's testosterone immediately. Go to the pharmacy and get it. I'll get it out of my own bag if I have to and give it to you or go to the ER and get it. Like that is how dangerous that is. If your testosterone is below 2%, your risk of heart attack and death goes up to 80%. If you're below 1%, your risk of death is like 95%. And in my personal opinion, I don't know how you would translate this to like a real recommendation and a guideline. I'm going limb here. If you're below 1% and if you're below half of 1%, your risk of death is 99%. You're, you're basically just going. <laughs> you're just, you're just wa a walking dead man at half of 1%. And any doctor who doesn't treat you, immediately their medical license should be suspended, and they should have to go through uh, you know, re-education. Um, and, and really, their medical license just should be immediately stripped. Um, if you're not testing for this, and you're not um, immediately um, helping these patients, no, you don't deserve to have a medical license. Um, the society puts a lot of trust in you, and if you're not helping and protecting people, and you don't know there's an epidemic when we have this many deaths, nah, dude, that's not how this works. 
and they cut their calories down to 1800 a day. Which I've got my lovely assistant Jasmine here, who is going to inject it into my booty. Oh yeah. Jesus. Neither of us have ever done this before. Never. Hello, hello to all of you beautiful people watching today's video. I'm making this video to let you guys know that after much deliberation, I have decided that I am going to go through with the testosterone replacement therapy. I'm at least going to give it a try. If you watched my recent video where I talked about how I believe Kratom had something, a little bit or a lot to do with my T levels dropping below, you know, the reference range, well, you would know that, well, just that. According to my blood work, my testosterone was abysmal. And what I forgot to mention in that video is I had actually spoken to two different doctors. I mean, technically three doctors about uh, my testosterone and two out of the three actually prescribed me TRT. So it wasn't like I just jumped on the first recommendation. I also extensively talked with Derek for more plates, more dates. This was something that I decided to do primarily because my mood has been shit for a while. I've been on this roller coaster of emotions for our, like the past five years. And I suspect that my testosterone has been steadily dropping over those past five years. I mean, there's only one way to really find out. If I do this TRT therapy and then within a month or two I don't feel any different, then we can safely say that testosterone has nothing to do with my declining mood and, uh, you know, energy levels. I mean, I don't think that's the case, but regardless, why not try it? If I don't notice anything after a couple months, I can stop or I can decide to keep going. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into my exact blood work. If you wanna learn just how low I was and reasons why you should probably get your own blood work tested, especially if you're male watching, you can find that video here. Essentially, I had the testosterone levels of like a 70 to 80 year old man. I mean, I was at 242 uh, nanograms per deciliter, at least when we're talking total testosterone. If you wanna know the rest of my numbers, such as free or bioavailable or the sex hormone binding globulin or my um you guys loved how i said this <laughs> Nine, my two, hemoglobin or as i pronounce it in the video my hemoglobin you can watch the video over here anyway for today's video what we're gonna do is i am going to have my lovely partner jasmine inject me with the first dose of testosterone oh boy um, just to be crystal clear, this is doctor prescribed and everything I'm showing you is under the supervision of a doctor. I am having my blood work taken monthly to monitor my levels very closely and we're going to see if the dose that he's prescribed is acceptable or if we need to raise it or lower it, etc. The prescribed dose is 120 milligrams uh, per week of testosterone in anthate. I'm prefacing the video by pointing that out because I don't want to make it look like I am supporting everybody jump on DRT. No, my levels were shit. I got the opinions of several doctors as well as a YouTube expert, Mr. Derek, Captain Deltoids, and everybody suggested that due to the the symptoms I was presenting and the actual lab work shown, this would be something that could substantially or potentially help me, which is why I did this. But I don't think it's for everybody and I don't even know if I'm going to enjoy it. So please don't just follow my example and jump on TRT <laughs> because you suspect that your T is low. Also, full disclosure, the video that I'm about to show you where she does my first injection was filmed about two weeks ago, meaning I've been doing it for two weeks now. And one of the things that you're gonna notice is I look substantially thinner in this video, especially my face. I've got some facial bloat going on via the enhanced water retention caused by having more testosterone floating around the bloodstream. I actually don't really mind it. I, I think I look better with a rounder, fuller face. Beyond that, I'm not gonna get into any mood enhancements that I may or may not be experiencing. Uh, to be totally honest, actually, I, I don't think I've noticed really anything, very, very little at all, which lines up with what most people say. It takes about a month to really start feeling it. Some people do get placebo effects within the first couple or three weeks, but it's around the three week to a month mark where they're finally like, whoa, okay. It's like they just wake up one day and they just feel better, which I'm waiting for that moment hasn't hit yet. But anyway, without further ado, let's jump head first into my first injection. As someone with a fear of needles, this was a big hurdle for me to overcome. According to YouTube guidelines shown here, videos which intend to educate are documentary by nature and do not glorify the use of drugs. Those abide by community safety guidelines and are eligible for monetization. The following video does not glorify the use of drugs. Instead, attempts to be non-biased while delivering model life safety information disguised as entertainment. We do not display graphic use. There are no scenes showcasing drug consumption and any insinuation use should be taken as satirical at best. Thank you, too. Can't tell if my head is cut off. My head is cut off. Okay. All right, here we are. Back again for some Sazul Dude, this time. This guy was literally on deathbed's door and he didn't know it. Thankfully, he's connected to Derek because whatever medical system and whatever's going on in his life where 
this isn't part of a normal thing that you would get your blood levels checked to figure out like where you're at, what you're doing, you know, how you can live a healthy life. I mean, also too, it's my understanding that they have a mixed system in Canada. So I think that they have a state run system that provides some sort of level of Medicaid for everyone. And then there's like a private system or something like that. I don't know how difficult it is to go get your own blood work done or, you know, get a doctor say, Hey, here are these labs, you know, here to get it or whatnot and, uh, and do it. But with the low cost of, you know, how much blood work costs or whatnot, there's really no reason to just get it done on your own. Um, it's going to save your life. And in, uh, in psych substances case, it literally saved his life and he would have died if he didn't have it. Um, you, no doctor can, with a straight face, tell me that someone under 1% can live with that low of free testosterone. That is not how it works. And if you say that, um, I question that you even have a medical license. And then two, why would you even have one if you don't know that? Because then your patients won't be alive for you to treat them, which means then you won't have a job. So there's kind of that. Five milligrams for this uh, first injection. So apparently it's hard to draw with such a small needle like this. So that's why I have this other one that's a 23 gauge so we can draw it and then switch the head after. I'm sure there's a better way to go about doing it, but this was just... <laughs> Hemoglobin is like, the, the, you should totally do a t-shirt on this, by the way. It is a hilarious joke. And the, the Hemoglobin comes out to, to get you. And uh, it does, right? So if you have low uh, low testosterone, your insulin levels and hemoglobin A1C and your uh, all of the other systems within your body are just going fucking haywire. And you're going to have insulin resistance. You're going to start growing a ton of weight. Your uh, growth hormone is probably in the in the crapper. Your thyroid's in the crapper. Uh, you probably definitely don't have any vitamin D left. And then your body is just essentially functioning on this hemoglobin that's just chomping away and eating up all the good stuff in your body, leading to cancer and you know leading to an early death that can be completely preventable. There was two ways to do it. There's one way without doing the whole air thing. We're gonna ditch the air thing. By the way, if you haven't seen this before, this is an absolute shit show. <laughs> I'm pulling and nothing's happening, so maybe you do have to put a bunch of air in it first. So, you said half? Just go way more, because the half wasn't enough. Go to like one, maybe? And you have to do it with it tilted upside down like I had it. When you put it in. Yeah. And now push the air in. This is very good starting place. Um, you know, a lot of the bodybuilding kind of people or whatnot would say, oh, you know, you start at this dose or this dose. Um, in the UK, we have uh, dummies who are, um, you know, using whatever, you know, long acting esters, but then putting a gram of medication in a patient. That's not how CYP450 enzymes work and aromatase function. Um, the body could then, you know, look at that um, medication and then just scoop up half of it. And then, uh, you know, many stories that I hear about a, a Nabito and Aved uh, medications, which are long acting esters, my understanding is that's in decanoate. And technically it lasts from seven to 14 days or whatnot. And then you're giving a gram of medication, which is supposed to last, you know, three months or some nonsense. No. Um, our goal is to use the lowest efficacious dose um, to start out higher frequency of injections to then equate to stable blood concentrations and constant levels. So if some doctor says, oh, I'm going to give you this medication every two weeks or every month or every three months, say no, thank you. I'd like to stick to testosterone cypionate two times a week at minimum, figure out where my um, brain level and chemistry is at and figure out, you know, how I'm going to be stable. And then I like to go from there. They don't want to do that. Well, then find another doctor who will, because that's the best thing we can use. It's cheap. It's easy. Um, uh, there's no, uh, you know, negative health consequences from that. And then if you're giving someone um, even testosterone cypionate or name your ester and you're giving them a gram of medication at a time or 600 milligrams at a time or something like that 
We really don't want to do that because we want to have constant uh, blood levels and we want to get a free testosterone level of roughly 56 nanograms per deciliter, somewhere around there, between 30 and 70 or something in that kind of range. And for a total testosterone range, roughly between, um, you know, 700 to 2000, somewhere in there. But it's this is all based on feeling and how well you're doing and, and kind of, you know, not having gynecomastia and, and uh, blood pressure and human hemoglobin a1c and um uh, your different blood markers right so this is different in every person but we want to have uh, constant and frequent um in injections um to the maintain stable blood levels so that we don't have these huge spikes and these huge um downs it's like substance case right he's talking about how he's got a lot of these depressive side effects and the way to prevent pr uh, depressive side effects is by having constant stable levels so first, oh, make sure your hands are clean. For a few seconds. If this is the first time using the testosterone vial, pop the plastic safety yeah. cap off of the top. Next, use one of the alcohol swabs to wipe clean the rubber center part on the top of the vial. That's it. Was that the right spot? Next, we are going like to change painless. out the needle. So first, no. unwrap the syringe. Yeah. Cool. Are you sure you're supposed to go 90 degrees and though? And you're going to twist off the 25 degrees. gauge needle that comes oh, attached. Oh boy. Set this aside. So now all the needles are garbage. Now, take the 18 How'd you gauge feel needle. That process? I don't like doing that. <laughs> Unwrap it. I don't like it at all. Oh, I feel weird. Time and of injection. It to the syringe. 3 p.m. Simply by twisting until it clicks. Okay. And kind of squeals. I feel Next, weird. Carefully but like I don't actually feel weird. Needle. Something very, very important that gets missed within um, testosterone is the fact that um, patients kind of assume that obviously because it has this um, upregulation of testosterone um, that it's going to equal virility, which then equals more muscle mass, which then equates to looking harder and firmer. Well, it's kind of the opposite when it comes to the initial starting out. One, we're going to be gaining between 1 to 10 pounds of of muscle along with water retention and bone density so 20 pounds of weight is just roughly fluctuations within the body of bone density fluid balance and then our fat to um, uh, muscle uh, relationship and it's very important to add in salt into this. And from Dr. DiNicola Antonio, who wrote the book, The Salt Fix, we need roughly 1.5 to 3 grams of salt. And since we're in a, in a mediary phase of uh, fluid reten retensive balance, we want to add probably more like 3 to 5 grams of salt uh, per day. And utilizing Redmond salt, because it's one of the only salt mines that has not been touched by uh, the oceans and plastics and that sort of shit. It's like three to five bucks to get this stuff on Amazon. So just get some Redmond salt, use that stuff, um, and, 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 and load that so that you have more salt in the body. So then you, your body knows that it can actually get rid of various water because it's going to be affecting the balance of the water in your body. When we look at sodium in the blood, you're looking at the body freaking out. And if it's super, super high, it means that you don't have enough sodium because it's asking for more sodium. So our, the point of this is so that we add more sodium so that you work through the fluid balance problems and same thing with the keto flu. If you're lowering the amount of insulin that you have in the body, it's not able to get more of that sodium that you would need. So that's where the keto flu comes from. And if you, because it's dropping as much fluid as it can, because you don't have any more of that glycogen response to then keep that in the body. So you just add more salt and you're going to be good and you'll feel good. Decaps on a new vial before you use it. Next, you're going to take your alcohol prep pads and you're gonna clean the top of both of the vials. You wanna focus on the center rubber cap. So just clean the top like that. To be very clear, it takes roughly um, eight to 10 weeks to know the full extent of 
the medication and at roughly eight to ten weeks then you can start titrating your dose up and down but a month is not really an, uh, enough time to know you know what the medication is doing um, what effects that it's having on the body um, a month is a good enough knowledge to know at least um, your injection frequency and that happens fairly rapidly that you know okay well i have a crash here so i take my dose on you know day one and by you know day five i feel like shit well okay you take your dose at day three and you just split it up and you take one dose on you know monday and another dose on wednesday or thursday and then you feel pretty good and then there's not a lot of these ups and downs now if you're a hyper responder which is very 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 important in my opinion is probably most traumatic brain injury sufferers um, or depression sufferers probably have something going on with SHBG or albumin or some sort of aromatase function. There's no studies on this. There's no way to know. But most likely, we're eating up the medication quickly. And so you would want to, and for opioid users um, who have impaired um, hypothalamus, pituitary, whatever, whatever, um, eating up or blocking the uh, androgen functions, um, we would want to have more frequent injections. So in that case, you know, with these type of patients, you definitely want to have three minimum injections, if not daily administration or every other day, um, to make sure that you have stable levels. And you know, this and this is my case. Uh, you know, maybe for TBI patients, this is where we would want to use a compounded cream. I'm not personally convinced. You know, I don't. I won't personally be you know changing over to that since I've been dialed in on testosterone cypionate. But there is a case that's there for frequent administration and daily um, daily administration. And since you're going to be doing that that way, that would be able to do that. And utilizing Dr. Keith Nichols' strategy on um, scrotal application of the medication, we can achieve efficacious dosage by using 2,000 milligrams. My remembrance comes back uh and uh utilizing uh twice daily application to the scrotum or to the uh, uh allergies uh women's scrotal cream <laughs> uh, formulations and um u utilizing uh, that method uh to achieve stable blood concentrations It's actually a difficult word to say, propionate, which I, I mess up all the time. <laughs> dates for plates. <laughs> plates for dates. This is an absolute shit show, by the way. Like, I watched this earlier. Oh, man. This is so bad. Oh, it was 25. Jeez, it looked like 18. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't see this part when I originally watched it. Okay. So let's uh, let's start off with this. When you originally start, you want to have the materials with you, everything that you need. So you need to have a bunch of prep pads, buy alcohol prep pads. Get those. Those are important. 
Um, you want to get fabric band-aids. Those are the best ones, in my opinion. Those stay on. They're easy. So if you know you bleed a little bit or something like that, it stays on. Um, you want to have 18-gauge draw needles. These are freaking ginormous. These draw needles are not what you inject into your body. Say that again. 18 gauge needles are not what you inject into your body. You're going to take off the syringe of uh of the of the syringe, you know, package that you got that it's say it's 27 gauge or 29 gauge and they have replaceable needles or whatnot. And uh, you're going to take off that draw needle and uh, you're going to attach it to the syringe. Now, you're going to hand crank it Every single time you put a, a needle on, you're going to hand crank that uh, that needle onto the syringe. Um, you're then going to take a full syringe of air. You're not going to do your dose. You're going to take a full syringe of air. This is the key special sauce to how to do injections. You're going to take the full syringe of air. You're going to, with the uh, uh, vial standing right side up you're gonna inject that uh, air into the uh, into the vial you're then going to flip it over um, you know with the the syringe um, pointed upwards and the vial pointed down you're gonna keep that needle inside of the oil and then you're going to pull out the dosage that you need and because you have that over back pressure of air you're gonna be able to get more of that medication into the syringe now after you've done that you're gonna then take the uh, the plastic cover, put that back on your draw needle, take the draw needle off, and then put your 27 gauge or 29 gauge or 31, if you can get it, gauge needle. You're then going to hand crank that back onto your syringe, and then you're going to um, draw up to um, close to your amount of uh, medication, and you want to get like a, a at least one, uh, one or two drops to come out of the needle onto the syringe and uh, onto the onto the needle. So this is going to allow you more lubrication for when you administer the medication. And this works really, really well. It's a secret that everybody uses for oil-based medications and works every single time. Um, you're then going to inject that um, into your quads or your deltoids or your booty or... Um, if you're getting really frisky, I guess your traps and uh, some. Uh, uh, if you're feeling really frisky, I guess your uh, your uh, the the back part of your legs or something like that. There's a few guys that do that. It's pretty crazy, but uh, that's how you're gonna do this. Not what a uh, psych substance is doing. He's doing everything wrong. <laughs> And actually, this is really important. So watching him do this, this is exactly everything that you're not supposed to do. Um, he used his um, a dose amount of air. Well, it doesn't really matter how much air that you put in there. What matters is that you draw out the medication that you need. So, I mean, even if you draw more medication than you needed, you can still inject that back into the vial because it's still a sterile vial and it's a sterile needle and the medication has a, a alcohol inside of it. So there's no risk of, uh, of putting really anything in there. Um, so you can do that and uh, it's, it's fairly easy to do. <laughs> this is just all wrong. <laughs> Also, in intramuscular injections, bubbles don't matter. It's not important. Um, this is not an IV. We're not a... We don't have any risk of uh, whatever happens when you put oxygen into the veins. That's not how intramuscular injections work. It really doesn't matter if you have uh, bubbles in there. We don't need to aspirate or something like that. Um, we have large blood flow going through these muscles, and that's the whole entire point of putting intramuscular injections into those areas because those are the areas that are deemed safe and away from blood vessels and away from veins.
Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're turning the vial upside down when they're putting the air in, which is not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> because then your needle is inside the medication. You want to have the needle outside of the medication when you put the air in the vial. Off. Yeah, and they used a really, really long needle. This was like a uh, uh, an inch and a half or even an inch or something like that. We really don't need to do that for testosterone. Um, there's no real benefit of going real deep. Um, shallow intermuscular injections work. It's not a problem. We're not going to have any issues with that or whatnot. And uh, by utilizing... Um, smaller needles um something that i've uh, began using is uh 27 gauge half inch needles um th these work really really well they're one ml they're from uh bd company and uh they have a lubric a sterile lubricant that's on it and you know you could do daily injections with all kinds of medications with them and you're going to heal up real quick and it's going to be super easy um i hope you guys have enjoyed this you know i really look forward to uh the responses um and the success of uh psych substance i hope that uh my knowledge helped him out in terms of uh doing things correctly and um you know utilizing the right techniques um to inject and and this also gets into hey you know you might want to have your doctor show you the right techniques or whatnot and uh heck even get derek uh, from plates for dates on here and have him uh show you how to do the right types of injections um the right techniques and whatnot i uh hope you guys have enjoyed this uh, please share it um with your friends and uh, you guys be safe out there